Every single person, the one great equalizer is weather. But if you live on planet Earth, you interact and experience weather on a day-to-day -day basis. Weather is such a powerful force and it can impact, you know, just abruptly stop society. Phoenix, we are smack dab in the middle of the desert. It is dry, it is hot, and in the summertime, we can get up to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit on some days. Even if we took climate change out of the equation, we would still see people dying of extreme heat. Heat is everybody's concern, but hasn't been anybody's responsibility. Until now. Phoenix, Arizona just became the first city in the world to create a publicly funded office focused on heat. Made possible by a $2.8 million government investment for climate and heat readiness, this new office is charged with keeping people alive and cooling down America's hottest city. We have here in Maricopa County the, what is probably the world's leading heat health surveillance program. Nobody does a better job of counting how many people get sick and die from heat and understanding what the causes were than our county and state health department here. Because of those great statistics that we have, unfortunately we see some patterns that are not great at all, patterns moving in the wrong direction. In each of the last four years, we've set records in terms of the number of people who have died from heat. Heat is a now problem. It's not a problem we're thinking about in the future in 50 years when it will be hotter. It's a problem that needs to be solved today. I don't think that anybody should ever die of extreme heat. We have enough resources in this world and knowledge to keep people safe. Jenny and Dave are both on a quest to make living with extreme heat more livable. They also happen to be married. The dinner conversations are, uh, yeah, would be of interest to a very small crowd uh, a lot of the time. Like Jenny, Dave is a professor at Arizona State University, and he splits his time between campus and city office. We've literally had the experience where I'll be in a meeting with somebody trying to help us understand how the city's landscaping contracts work related to the water and trees. And then in the next hour, we're debating if city volunteers can administer Narcan to help reduce the adverse impacts of overdosing. We get pulled in so many different directions. Teamwork is critical. How can the university be answering the questions that the city is asking? And how can the city hear what the university is doing? I think we can do a better job making those connections. And I certainly interpret that as part of my job working for both right now. Phoenix is really a living laboratory for heat. And there are a lot of things that we can test here that other places in the nation can try to implement and, and follow. That living laboratory has brought scientists from all over the world to the campus of Arizona State University, ranked top in the nation in pursuit of UN sustainability goals. The impact that weather can have on people's basic necessities really drew me into the heat aspect of things. Phoenix was the perfect opportunity, ASU was the perfect partner to help me further my education, really get that hands-on experience with the community. Zach works in the shade lab with Ariane and Marty, a biometeorological garden cart. Marty is a robot that can measure how you experience heat when you're walking outdoors. So when it's sunny, when it's 110 out here in Phoenix, Marty can tell you how miserable you are. <laughs> this setup has existed before in previous studies. People just take a tripod, uh, set the sensors up, and then just let them log for the whole day. But that's not very convenient if you want to compare different spots to each other. So uh, we came up with this solution of attaching the sensors to this $70 garden cart. I love it. And he's got a license plate, so he's ready to hit the road. Marty is a world traveler. Recently, Marty has made some friends, and Marty is being joined in his quest to measure heat by martinis. And martinis are mini Martys. They measure the same thing, but they're much smaller, they're much cheaper, so that they can be deployed in parks and cities. My computer here shows uh, surface temperatures on campus, and you can see that the red area right here, that is concrete, and it's red hot. So this was 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the day. And then you see the yellow color scheme here, that's trees, and they're much cooler. We recently finished a, a project that we called 50 Grades of Shade, and uh, we took Marty out on the road to measure all kinds of different types of shade that you can imagine shade sails, shade from trees, shade from buildings, from overhangs, to see if there are any alternatives to trees, because cities here in the valley have a hard time planting trees. It's very hot and we don't have a lot of water. The water conversation is absolutely one that's right up against the heat conversation. I think the most 
immediate connection that we need to be thinking about strategically as the heat office is how are we going to move forward on our very aggressive citywide tree planting goals without using considerable additional water resources. People need water, people need shade, trees need water to provide shade, especially in extreme heat. As global temperatures rise, local, state, and federal governments are all investing to improve water infrastructure. Certainly there is the factor of climate change, but there's also the evolution of the city. There are very few places around the United States that are growing faster in the residential or commercial sector than Phoenix. The urban heat island is a phenomenon whereby cities tend to be hotter than their surroundings. Cities are full of darker surfaces that absorb energy from the sun. They also have a lot of thermal mass, whether it's concrete or asphalt, so materials that absorb a lot of the heat, store it, and then release it later. And the geometry of a city, buildings and roads close together, can create what scientists call urban canyons. Where surfaces, which would normally cool themselves by radiating to the night sky, find that much of that radiation is intercepted by the surrounding walls. And so, as a result, cities tend to cool off much slower at night than, say, the open desert. Within the city, we can see those overnight lows that stay within the 90s at times, which really exposes people to long-term high temperatures that can cause pretty severe human health consequences and also be really stressful to the energy grid. One of the aspects of heat and infrastructure that really has us concerned is the connection between heat and electricity consumption. People need to crank their air conditioners on our hottest summer days to keep their homes comfortable and safe. Should we have a situation where there be a, a large large scale or prolonged power failure in the summer, that, that would really be one of our most serious types of disasters that we'd have to respond to. Having no access to air conditioning in a hot Phoenix summer is like having the heat go out in the middle of a Chicago winter, a daily reality for homeless Americans. There's actually three common ways that people would, would die from extreme heat. The most common cause of heat-related death is cardiovascular collapse. Your core temperature doesn't need to get to 104, 105, or 106 degrees Fahrenheit to die of cardiovascular collapse. What's happening in the body is the heart starting to work harder to keep the blood volume up and to get heat shed to the skin. But that's not the only way that heat can be fatal. Then we have your hyperthermia, where someone's core temperature is going to get into 105, 106, 107, 108, and your organs are going to start shutting down, and the ability for your body to thermoregulate and talk to your brain to, to keep things going, to keep sweating, to keep that blood pumping is going to start shutting down. And so that's your classic heat stroke example, when the core temperature does rise to excessive levels. Now the third way is through just a kidney failure, which can happen in connection with dehydration. Jenny and her team believe that every single heat-related death is preventable. It's just a matter of figuring out how. Luckily, they're about to get some help from Andy, the world's first walking, sweating mannequin. It is an incredibly advanced instrument that uh, has a shape of a human body, and it has 35 different surface areas that are all independently controlled, and each one can sweat independently, the mannequin can breathe. And we'll pair uh, Andy with Marty, the biometeorological cart, so that we can understand all the sweating mechanisms, the changing skin temperature, the changing core temperature, and also start to test novel fabrics for clothing or novel heat mitigation techniques outdoors to see how that would impact then the time course towards experiencing hyperthermia. We can push it to overheat, so to say, more than we can do with a human trial. So with the mannequin, we can actually take it to, say, a uh, old mobile home where AC went off. And we can see how long you know, Andy would, it would take for Andy to get sick. We might be killing Andy, but we have a full service contract, so it's okay. While Marty and Andy are out measuring the effects of extreme heat, other ASU researchers are going straight to the source. <laughs> The sun is the biggest input of energy into the urban system, so we're constantly trying to find ways to reject the heat from the sun. One of the best ways is through more reflective surfaces, surfaces that reflect the energy of the sun. And so, of course, we do this on rooftop surfaces. Oftentimes when people think of that, they think, oh, white, white roofs. But it's important to recognize that less than half of the energy of the sun is in the spectrum that you and I see with our eyes. And so a lot of the energy that's hitting surfaces is coming in wavelengths outside of what we can see. And so you can actually engineer surfaces that have spectral reflectance characteristics so that 
They look the color that you want, but they're still highly reflective to the sun's energy. One of these reflects three times more energy of the sun than the other. So if I take an infrared image of this with this camera, uh -huh. you can actually see Whoa. that one of them is much hotter than the other. That's incredible. That's blowing my mind. Yep. Science. Science. Paving is some of the darkest surface and the most absorptive surfaces in the city. Black asphalt uh, here in Phoenix can be 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. All right, so this is asphalt. Yeah, this is the traditional uh, material here. And then we have coated pavement uh, just a couple inches away. Yeah, it's, it's definitely cooler. That's amazing. So by having more reflective paving, we're able to reject a higher fraction of the energy of the sun, keep the surfaces cool, and then as the air flows over those surfaces, it picks up less heat. The big vision or goal is that we could actually reduce the air temperature in the city, especially here in downtown Phoenix, where we're at the epicenter of the urban heat island. And ultimately that can mean for, for the neighbors around here, they're spending less on their air conditioning bills and that they're more comfortable out on a walk on a summer day. When we look at the health statistics across the whole country, heat kills more people every year than almost all other hazards combined. Every tornado, every hurricane, every flood, uh, on the whole, their health impacts typically don't add up to the total health burden we see from extreme heat. When you think about weather in general, it impacts everybody differently, depending on whether or not you have housing, your socioeconomic status, age, race, um, how much time you spend out in the heat, your occupation. Within Phoenix, we see middle-aged men being pretty vulnerable. So thinking about outdoor workers, we also see the elderly, of course, uh, being very vulnerable. Other populations that we tend to really want to protect and focus on are anyone who might be unhoused and not have that ability to cool off during the hottest times. And then children are really important to focus on as well because they might not have that experience or know where to go or know what to do when it is very hot. And so their adaptive capacity is much lower. For many people here in Phoenix who can afford it, the city is livable 12 months year round. We can live in an air conditioned home, go to our air conditioned vehicle, travel to our air conditioned office, find an air conditioned place to recreate uh, on a summer evening. And it, it, it's almost as though the summer is not even happening outside the walls. But for other people, the city is not livable right now by the fact that people are dying because of heat exposure here in, in Phoenix. It is literally not livable for them. When we think about our unsheltered neighbors, that's really where we see the greatest need. Like many other cities are experiencing right now, we're seeing a housing affordability squeeze that is pushing more and more people onto the street uh, each day. And every one of those people are at risk. I don't think we can rest. And I think that means everything from looking at our heat response measures to be sure that people are not getting sick and not dying at an alarming rate uh, here in the summer, to be sure that people can walk through the city and have a comfortable experience 12 months per year. And that's related to providing trees and shade structures and uh, other important infrastructure. The city of Phoenix wants to be certified heat ready. The National Weather Service has a storm ready program. To date, it has certified more than 3,000 communities across the country. We've been thinking about what a, what a rubric looks like, a checklist, a program that cities could go to to understand that they have at least some basic competencies in place for managing heat. People are talking more about it. People are more aware of it. There's a lot more people studying the problem of extreme heat and realizing what kind of problem it is for the nation. The more data you have, both health data and weather data at finer scales, the more we can know about what's happening to people in the places they live. Collaboration and, and listening are really important parts of our job. I know I don't have the answers alone and our office won't have the answers alone to all those questions, but knowing how to get the answers, where to get the answers, I think will be absolutely critical and is arguably how we should be judged. I think here in Phoenix, we're seeing that, that innovative, that experimental sense that I think is really important. We hear so much from, from residents, we know what to do, just do it. 